My name is Kier. I am a product manager in Google Cloud. I work on Cloud PubSub. Um, uh, and that means I get to talk to a lot of data engineers across the world, um, both users of Cloud PubSub and Kafka and things like Dataflow and BigQuery. So uh, we'll, uh, today's session will be about using those tools. Now, there are a couple things that um, are interesting about Kier that is me in this context. One is, as I said, I get to work on um, Cloud PubSub, which is a very large distributed service that we try to run with um, a very good availability. And we've learned a few things about using real-time streaming data to help us do that. So I will share some of that experience to help motivate why stream analytics is important, to answer the question why this matters. The um, second reason is that, as I said, it's, I'm lucky enough to have it as part of my job to, to speak to a lot of data engineering teams. Um, and so I've learned quite a bit over over my last few years doing that, so I'm grateful for that. And I've learned that uh, it's a pretty interesting time in the industry with a lot of interesting people. So I'm, gonna, um, uh, if, um, I'm going to take just a few seconds out of this talk to say, if there's somebody you don't know next to you, and they're probably an interesting data engineer, say hello. You don't have to if you're uncomfortable, but I'll, I'll, I'll awkwardly stand here for 10 seconds. <laughs> but really, shake, shake the hand. Hey. All right. <laughs> All right. I, I hope you met another person. And after, after this talk, you can, uh, you can ask them what they do. And so, um, I'll, so what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop with the, with the corny jokes, and I'll, I'll try to answer a couple questions, which is you know, um, really one question. Why do we care about stream analytics? And why, why do we need fresh data, which is really what this is about? And then I'll, I'll hand this off to, to a person who, um, who actually uh, um, has had quite a bit of success with building stream analytic systems on GCP. That's Simon Foreman, who is the head of behavioral data engineering at ITV. That's one of England's premier TV networks. Um, so he'll tell you a lot more about, um, about that. So, Let's get into it. So uh, stream analytics is about moving from dealing with files to give you a figure 10 megabytes plus to dealing with one kilobyte at a time. Right? As soon as a thing happens, you process it. Um, and that requires a bit of a shift in thinking, um, a new kind of technology. You need new storage technology, you need new processing technology, and you need a new way to access your data. So on the storage, again, we've, we've had Tremendous amount of success with technologies for handling blobs, large files. Now you need things like Cloud PubSub and Apache Kafka that are great at accepting appends um, and persisting them on disk at one kilobyte at a time. All right? um, there are no more files. They're kind of infinite. right? So you need to be able to deal with that. Um, and you need to be able to let multiple distributed clients tail these files without introducing latency. So that's a new kind of, um, that's a new kind of storage technology. On the processing side, you have now jobs that don't just come up, process a file, and shut down. You have jobs that run for not hours, but days and months and sometimes years. So you need something that's stable um, enough to do this. You need something that can recover and heal itself when it's not having a good time. Um, and you need something that is going to be um, able to help you deal with data that is unbounded. Right? There are no files. There's no end of file. So how do, you, how do you know when you've gotten everything? Uh, it turns out that it's not a trivial problem. So uh, tools like Dataflow and, um, and, Spark and, and Apache Spark and Flink start solving that. Um, and finally, once you've done all of this, sort of you've done the work of persisting the data and processing it um, in, let's say, 100 milliseconds or a second, you need a storage and access system or a database that is not going to take all that away. away. So um, we talk about BigQuery streaming API here, which, is, which allows you to get to your data um, uh, instantly. So uh, now, why do you care to make the shift in your organization? Right? There's been a lot of success. Just you know, so Many operations teams, in fact, will tell you, well, we're very happy to, to just have our data. It doesn't matter that it's fresh. It doesn't matter that it's streaming. Like, if you give me my data within an hour, uh, when it, within an hour of it being generated, I'm, I'm great. Why do you care? Um, there, are, um, there are many reasons to, to, to do this, and I'll try to sort of uh, focus on, on a couple that often get overlooked. Um, partly because um, they are a little bit too close 
and there seem, seem obvious, and partly because in some ways measuring quality service and sort of saying ops is a bit, is a bit too, um, um, uh, measuring quality of service has, has historically been rather difficult, so we've kind of glossed over it. So again, the two reasons to, to care about stream analytics is that you need fresh data on your quality of service. Um, when things go wrong with whatever it is that your company does, you should know about it not in an hour, you should know about it now, in 10 seconds, in a minute, right? But not an hour. And when you do know about this, you need your operations teams, your SRE team, you know, your content operations, your finance operations, to have all the supporting data to resolve the problem right there and then. So you need fresh data on quality of service and fresh data on operations. So yes, there is some feature deep in your backlog that's about flying cars and recommendations and instant sort of um, an instant optimization of everything and A-B testing that is all wonderful. Um, but, um, but stream analytics is about something much more basic than that. It's quality of service. So I'll try to not, um, um, I'll try to give you a more concrete example based on something that I know and sort of experienced firsthand, which is um, how we think about quality of service at, at Cloud PubSub in GCP. And that's um, generally representative of, of how other services are run at Google. So um, when we launched a few years back, we started with a single SLA, service level agreement, that was our promise to our customers, which was that when your front ends were ready to hand us off a piece of data, an event, a log entry, um, we, would be, we would accept it with high likelihood. We had four and a half nines of availability, I think, uh, when we started. Um, and so that was our SLA. Um, and behind it, there was an SLO, a service level objective, which is a metric that was measured in real time, right? And someone's pager was connected to it. So if, if all of a sudden you couldn't publish your data, your front ends had to accumulate it in their, in their memory and were on their way to crashing, um, someone's pager was going off and we would fix it. Um, and then we had a, a bunch of um, low volume probers that would exercise the system, sort of different paths through the system uh, using synthetic traffic. Um, moving on from there, we've, we've designed a brilliant alerting system, which was to use our users um, as a way to get us data when, when things were things were going wrong. So um, something would, would go wrong with your application. Let's say you couldn't create a topic or get your data. You would submit a ticket um, to our support system. It would get triaged by frontline support personnel, get escalated to a specialist, get escalated to, a, um, to uh, the engineering team. And then finally, um, just short hours, weeks, days or weeks later, the issue would be fixed. Um, this is, of course, sort of, I'm being facetious here. This was a horrible system. Even that uh, was sort of a step up for, for many users because um, uh, oftentimes these systems within individual organizations are run uh, by much smaller teams. Um, but certainly using, using our users as an alerting system or um, taking hours to weeks to resolve issues that went be excuse me, beyond um, our primary SLA was really no way to live. Um, and so we've changed things a bit and we said, okay, Let's, let's understand our quality service of service, actually the way our users actually perceive it. And at the end of this exercise, or rather sort of at the stage where we are now, we went from sort of one primary user-facing SLA or, and SLO backing it to 234 SLOs that are all connected to someone's pager. And so we said, our promise to the world is really not that um, you can publish a message. It's not uptime, right? It's our entire API. We publish, our, you know, we publish our API as a protobuf, you can see it, and all of it is a promise. So we want to make sure that the whole thing is working. So we had to look at availability across all operations in real time. Um, we had to look at not just the success rate, but also the latency of operations. We want to make sure we understood that there, uh, when things were not going, um, going right in, um, uh, inter in, in, in that respect. And we had to, uh, uh, sort of uh, looking deeper at this, we had to realize that it wasn't just about the API. Our promise to the world went beyond the API. It wasn't that you could publish a message and receive a message. It was that the message would be delivered from a publisher to every single subscriber. Turns out that's not an API method. All right, it's something synthetic you have to compute by joining multiple API calls. Um, so we started looking at end-to-end -end latency of message delivery. Um, and then finally, we had to sort of make all of this data available so that we could respond um, to issues with, with um, any of these SLOs within minutes um, and hopefully uh, uh, get to them before any of our customers would, um, would uh, have to submit a ticket. So 
Um, this is what it looks like today. Um, I've put some, some X's there. Um, you can ask me what the actual numbers are. Um, just as an example, publish. Um, I'm giving you an example of a publish operations, but we, we, have, um, we have the same thing uh, for others. So um, uh, we look at the overall method availability. We have to normalize it somehow so that successful traffic from really large customers doesn't obscure terrible problems from small volume customers. We have to look at it in each individual region. So here there's US West, but um, we have to have it in, um, uh, in, in every single region where GCP uh, runs. Um, and finally, we have to look at these latency numbers. And then we repeat this for, for every other operation. I've talked, to, I've talked about end-to-end -end latency, right? We had to measure that also, not, and that's sort of a straightforward thing to do. Um, we had to look at latency within each individual region. We also make a, a rather unique promise to the world, which is that we, could, um, we will deliver your message uh, to wherever your uh, clients are from wherever they were published. So we're a global service. So we had to have operations. We have to have metrics per continent pair. Um, and then finally, we had to sort of have a few SLOs for administrative operations. They're interesting only in that there are different expectations around them, so SLOs are different. So uh, having gone through this exercise, we realized that sort of you know, these are metrics from, from this year, um, and I'm very happy with those. Uh, they weren't like this when we started. The color was red when we started. And that was the primary, sort of the primary impact of, of this exercise was to realize that the, there's, 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 things are not well and fixing it. So this is a true humble brag, and that this is a brag. I'm very excited that we measure so many things and we're great at them. But this is also pretty, it's a pretty humbling experience because until we did this, it turned out that there were 233 dimensions of our customer experience that we had no idea about until somebody submitted a ticket. Um, so I bet that's, that's happening in your organization. And I think that um, that, in my mind, gets at the core of why stream analytics and fresh data is important. It's just quality of service. Um, I'll, answer, I'll, I'll try to answer one more question before um, I, I hand this off to, to Simon to talk about sort of how, how you actually do this, these things, which is, um, fine, metrics are great, SLOs are great. Everybody read the SRE book? Yes? Yes, I'm seeing, I'm seeing nodding hands. Great. Metrics are great, but why do you need to build new things? Don't we have monitoring tools like Stackdriver um, for operations metrics and Google Analytics for content metrics? Those work. The answer is, of course, they do. And you should use them for everything you can. But I bet you there's something about your company that is unique. You are in business because you do something that is different from what everybody else is doing. Right? And so there's going to be that one metric that is absolutely core to what your business is, um, that, that you're going to need to compute by yourself and figure out how to measure. So in the example of PubSub, it seemed like um, we kind of had it all under control, right? It was just an API, and you know what an API success rate is. But then you get into all these things of like, OK, well, the API is running in different regions, and there are customer sizes that, that, that vary by multiple orders of magnitude. How do, you, how do you normalize them, right? How do you make sure that every customer is happy? That's not a standard sort of thing. That's a value judgment you have to make for your business. And then you get into things like end-to-end -end latency, right? Again, the reason I took you through that whole story is to just give you a sense of the depth Right? You can start getting at when you start pushing it at the definition of your, of your promise to the world. Right? And so with end-to-end with -end latency, the thing, the thing that was kind of non-obvious at first, right? we started and said, all right, end-to-end -end latency is about a difference between two timestamps. Timestamp a message when it comes in, and when somebody says, give me a message, you compute the difference and emit a real value. Amazing. Not, not, very, not very interesting, though. It turns out that that's not the whole story. Because what we promise is that if you, give us, um, if you give us enough opportunities to deliver a message, we will do that. But if you're not, we can't, be, you know, we, we can't have uh, our pages ringing. That's not our promise. Um, and so it, as it turns out, the reasons why we may not sometimes be able to send you a message has to do with your client state. So sometimes clients are under-provisioned. Right? Um, Maybe you have messages that require two machines to process, but you only have one machine, or you have a spike or something, right? Um, you, don't, you don't give us enough opportunities to deliver. Messages pile up. Latency goes up. It's not a systems problem. It's not us breaking a promise. Sometimes there are bugs in clients. Um, 
the um, you grab um, you as a client you get a message, um, you um, process it and then you crash before acknowledging it on for or for Kafka people before committing the offset, right? Um, the um, that we we deliver the message to you. We're doing everything right, right? But the timestamp grows. Um, sometimes users choose not to not to consume messages with low latency, and so all of a sudden, what this means is that in order to compute that difference of timestamps, you need to join it with some kind of stream of understanding of what your clients are doing for each individual client, and say, well, is this client in a healthy state or not? And if it is, then you can say, okay, we we trust this metric, right? So all this the simple timestamp difference um, becomes a complicated thing, and this is a thing that is absolutely at the core of what we do as a service. So I hope that gives you a sense for why stream analytics um, is important uh, to something very basic in your business. Again, not a thing deep in the backlog. All of that will come, I'm sure. Um, and I hope um, it gives you, gives you some ideas for what you might compute um, if you had the tools. Now, um, I, will, I will stop at this, and I will ask Simon Foreman up on stage to tell you about um, his journey at ITV in doing this. <clears throat> Thanks, Keir. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Simon Foreman, Head of Behavioral Data Engineering at ITV. Uh, so let's start there. What's behavioral data engineering? Well, it's building and running the systems that capture, process, and leverage data from our users as they visit our websites, use our apps, and watch our shows. You might think that sounds like traditional web analytics, but we actually do a lot more than that with the data that we have, and I'll talk about that later. So to, to rewind, three years ago, we weren't using GCP at all, and our analytics data was in the hands of a supplier with all the problems that that can bring. Uh, then I wrote our first prototype streaming data flow job and proved that it would work for our analytics use case. But then we had to take a big leap of faith. Although I'd proved the system would work, I couldn't predict how much it would cost to run or whether it would scale. So we took the risk, and I pushed the change to move all our analytics data over to the new system on GCP. And now I lead the engineering team as we do more and more exciting things with behavioral data. ITV is the largest commercial broadcaster in the UK, with broadcast TV channels and an online streaming service used by millions of people every day. Last summer, ITV had two massive events, the Football World Cup from Russia and the return of our reality TV hit, Love Island. In the football, England exceeded everyone's expectations and our audience size predictions, reaching the semi-final stage. That match was watched by 27 million people on our broadcast channel. That's the biggest UK TV audience since the Olympics in 2012. And even more impressively, Almost a million people streamed the match live online, beating our previous streaming record many times over. Love Island also attracted big audiences every day of its eight-week run, with more of the young audience choosing to stream rather than watch the broadcast channel. So both events had lots of viewers, but the load profiles were quite different. Football fans tend to start watching during the pre-game show, or even a bit after kickoff, giving a long ramp up to the highest audience, uh, shown by the blue line on the graph. Love Island's a different story. The show's in a broadcast slot with drama from the very first minute. So fans arrive en masse just as it starts. The steep green line shows just how quickly the audience goes from zero to hundreds of thousands in just a couple of minutes. These audiences generate huge amounts of data from my team systems and give us the challenge of collecting it all in real time and scaling our processing systems to handle it without slowing down. I'm going to talk about how we build and run the systems that handle that data on GCP, um, starting with our goals for the project. Now, although we run a video on demand service, our busiest events are actually live streaming, so we had to be ready for those surges. That means the collection system has to scale quickly but the rest of it needs to keep up, or we'll have angry consumers waiting for the data that they need. In the near future, we'll have to handle a lot more data as people continue to shift their attention to online streaming, and we incorporate other data sources. 
we want to avoid growing the team at the same rate. So we lean heavily on managed services with low operational support requirements. Uh, BigQuery and Cloud Functions are really good examples of this. We want people to trust our data, trust that it's complete and that it's accurate. And we want the front-end engineering teams to have an easy job of implementing data reporting for us. And finally, we want our downstream consumers, like data scientists, to be able to use the data we share with them as a foundation for their work without doing any tedious cleanup beforehand. GCP, and especially PubSub and BigQuery, make it very easy to deploy new applications that use data without any risk to existing ones. Now I'm going to show you some examples of what our systems actually look like, uh, starting with the one that receives data from our users. All of our apps and sites have embedded code that sends small pieces of data back to simple receiver services using HTTP. These services are either cloud functions or run on Compute Engine. The one that handles video playback events has to be able to cope with sudden surges from people watching live events. So we use sensitively configured auto-scaling to handle those highs without spending a fortune on excess capacity. This service does minimal processing of the events it receives. The strategy is to get them onto a PubSub topic as quickly as possible. Having everything go through PubSub means we can plug in different consumers very easily. In one case, we have 13 consumers for one topic. On the right of this diagram, there's a data flow job writing to BigQuery. This stores everything in its raw format, and it's a pattern that we repeat on most topics, whether they're dealing with uh, raw data, like this case, or aggregated. Often, this archive is needed for audit purposes, so we have to store it. But it's also been very helpful for debugging or to replay historical data through a new job. We considered uh, file-based storage for this instead of BigQuery, but there wasn't much difference in the cost. And having the data online in a way that was easily queried was a really nice benefit. Uh, now moving on to a more complex system. This diagram shows the flow of uh, video playback and site interaction data through two data flow jobs that first summarize, then sessionize it. Summarizing means turning possibly hundreds of events from one video stream into a single summary of the important bits, who the user was, what show they watched, how long they watched it for, and so on. This job's data source is the same topic the ingest service on the previous slide was pushing to. Sessionizing is pulling together all of the video summaries and site interactions for each user session and delivering them downstream as a bundle. This job reads summaries from the summarizer's output topic and raw site interaction data from another one and publishes to its own output topic. Hanging off the sessionizer's topic is a cloud function that applies some formatting before pushing to another topic that we use as the handoff to a third party. This gives them lots of flexibility about how they pull that data, be it streaming or batch or even push. Uh, in this diagram, you can also see two BigQuery logging jobs that store all the video summaries and the sessionized data in tables. And now onto a data flow job that gives us real-time quality of service data. This data shows us how our video streaming service is performing and lets ITV's operations team quickly jump on any problem. The job reads raw video playback events and aggregates them then publishes to a topic, typically with just 30 seconds of delay between a user having a problem like rebuffering and that being reflected in the output data. From the topic, we write to BigQuery for long-term storage and analysis, and we push to Splunk for live dashboards and alerting. Uh, and in the last example of architecture, I'll show you how the cross-device resume feature works. Uh, this is a product feature where you can pick up where you're playing on a different device, say, going from an iPhone to a smart TV. We push a subset of the same video event data uh, using a Node.js app into Redis and expose this to the front-end apps through a cloud function. Latency is absolutely critical here, so we're willing to trade some reliability to reduce it. 
we were able to save a heap of time and build this feature without adding any position logging code to the front-end apps. By reusing the data we already had and building a service to expose it in a new way. So that was a look at some of the things that we've built. Uh, now onto how we run them. Our internal customers care about data accuracy. We replaced an old analytics system, and we have to be at least as good as it was by that measure. They want data without any delay so that they can use it to power real-time product features and drive operational reporting. And they want us to quickly build new applications and incorporate more data sources into existing ones. And to support this, we have metrics, SLIs that we watch. At the ingest stage, we don't want any errors. We want to collect all the data and get it safely onto a PubSub topic. And we want that data to be high quality. It needs to match the spec for required fields and suitable values. Once we have the data and it's well formed, we need to process it quickly. And a good way to check that's happening is looking at the size of the backlogs on the PubSub subscriptions we use. And lastly, saturation. It's important to make sure we're not getting close to any capacity limits to avoid delaying, or even worse, losing any data. Uh, now I'll show you some of the dashboards that demonstrate this. Uh, the first one shows how we monitor the video data summarizer job. Uh, you can think of this job in classical input process output terms. It pulls messages from a pub subscription, the input, applies some business logic, that's the process, then outputs video summaries. The graphs here show how each of those stages is behaving. The two on the far left show the rate that data is being published to the input topic and how much of that hasn't yet been consumed by the data flow job. A backlog here would indicate the job not keeping up with the source data rate and consequently delaying its output. But the spikes in the graph here are short-lived, just a couple of minutes, and are caused by the job auto-scaling up and down, so they're not something to worry about. In the higher middle graph, there's a view of the data flow job's lag, which is a measure of the oldest data still being processed. If this is elevated, output data will again be delayed. Below that is what the auto-scaling system is doing. We want this to roughly move in line with the input data volume. If it isn't, that could be an indication of a problem. For example, hitting the maximum but still needing more resources to keep up. Top right is a custom metric. We added code to the data flow job to increment a counter whenever a condition's hit. In this case, it's counting malformed source data, data that we can't process because it doesn't have all the fields we need. We want this to stay a low fraction of the input rate. If it deviates from that trend, we could have a problem with our data sources. And lastly, the lower right graph shows how many summaries are being produced, the final output stage. A drop here means the job isn't producing the data it should be. Taken together, these graphs show the job's overall health and, if there's a problem, what the likely cause is. This dashboard looks at one of our ingest systems, the part that handles the fire hose of data coming in from our apps and sites. I'm a big fan of the SRE books, Four Golden Signals, uh, Traffic, Latency, Errors, and Saturation, and they're monitored here. At the top left, there's a view of the request rate, split by response code. Any problems with the service would show up here as uh, 500s. There usually aren't any, though, so that, uh, that hugs the x-axis. Below that is the service's latency, how quickly it's publishing the piece of data to PubSub and returning an OK back to the app. The apps aren't actually latency sensitive, and we're not affecting the user experience at all by being slow here. But increased latency does drastically reduce the service's capacity, so it could turn into a full outage if it continues or becomes more widespread. The orange, green, and purple graph uh, shows the service's uh, own view of how quickly PubSub is accepting data. Again, taking from the SRE book, uh, the time each publish operation takes is bucketed and counted. This gives a high-resolution view without storing and graphing millions of data points every minute. Everything in the orange region and above it is quicker than 100 milliseconds, with just a small number of requests taking longer than that. You might see them in the lower right area of the graph. Uh, lastly, saturation. 
The two graphs in the top right are from the auto-scaling group's monitoring. Obviously, hitting the upper configured limit is bad, but we also want to see the instance count, CPU, and request, re request rate roughly moving in sync with each other. And this last dashboard shows how we monitor the data feed out to our partner. A PubSub subscription is the boundary between our two organizations. We publish data to it, and uh, our partner pulls it. So the key metrics are the publish rate and the pull rate on the top row. If these stay balanced, we won't get a backlog, and data won't be delayed. If a backlog has grown, the lower two graphs show how much data and how many messages is waiting to be consumed. The spike in the center of the graphs was less of a problem than it than its shape suggests. Um, the backlog was only a few seconds worth of data, and it, it cleared quite quickly. So that was how we take care of running systems. But how do we deploy code when streaming jobs run 24-7? Things are a bit different with streaming. Um, updating cloud functions and simple compute engine apps is easy. There's no state, so they're naturally easy to change online. Data flow jobs that do hold state are much harder. Stopping and starting isn't an option, as that would lose some output data or introduce inaccuracy. The best solution is to live update the running job using Dataflow's built-in feature. This is quick and easy. In fact, we have Dataflow jobs that are updated automatically by our continuous deployment system. But it's sometimes not possible to use this feature. If there's a significant difference in the job structure or the code's not compatible, so we needed a smarter way to release fixes and improvements without stopping the job. <clears throat> Our solution for the video summarizer process is to start the updated job while the old one is still running. The new one gets its own input subscription, so it'll get a copy of the same data as the old one. But having two running causes a problem. The new job will also be emitting data, at best causing duplication, or if it doesn't have the full state, producing data that's just incorrect. We needed a way for the new job to wait until it had all the state it needed before it started outputting anything. And we needed the old job to stop producing data at exactly the same time, so that there was no duplication. Synchronizing the two jobs looked very complex and couldn't even guarantee exactly one's output. So we looked for a way for them to coordinate without any direct communication. The thing we came up with was to use a characteristic of the output data, here at the start time of the video stream, as the deciding factor. We pick a point in time and say any data from before then comes from the old job, and anything after that point comes from the new job. To implement this, we added a feature to the job where it could conditionally drop data instead of publishing it to the output topic. It still reads all the source data, applies the same logic, but just doesn't publish the result. So to go through the whole deployment process, to start with, the old version is running. That's the green line. And it's emitting data to the output topic, the green boxes. Then we deploy the new version, the blue line, and specify a cut over time some hours in the future and we reconfigure the old job with the same cut over time. Uh, we'll be able to see metrics from the new job, showing that it's working as expected. But if it isn't, we can just stop it and look into why. When data is produced for after the cut over time, it'll come from the new job. That's the blue boxes on the diagram. After a while, the old job won't be producing anything, so we can stop it and clear up its subscription. So that's a quick tour of our current work. What about the future? So we already support personalization features across our apps, and we're going to build even more of them, often using the same data we already have. We're working on ad tech to help our commercial teams deliver more value to our advertisers. Our platform provides a way for data scientists to quickly and easily put their research into production and work on challenges like improving marketing effectiveness and better understanding our audiences and how they use our products to increase engagement. And thanks to the capacity we have, we can begin to collect data from a, 
from our enormous broadcast audiences, <clears throat> gaining extra insight into our viewers. So to reflect on what we've achieved, we provide high quality data, qualities embedded throughout the pipeline from how we build our front end apps, through validating the data we receive, to checking that what, we've, what we're producing is correct. Our data is trusted by the people who use it. They know it's accurate, and they happily rely on it. It's available immediately. Our streaming jobs deliver useful, processed data without any delay, and we support real-time personalization features. Last summer, we had more online viewers and successfully collected many times more data than ever before while maintaining our latency and reliability SLOs. And we did that without any re-engineering. This gives us confidence to handle the next tenfold increase as more people move their viewing online and we begin to collect data from broadcast services. What started as an experiment with one data flow job has turned into a mature data platform that supports analytics, operational operations, and front-end product features, and sets us up for a future of more and more data-based applications. Thank you. Back to you, Keir. Thanks, Simon. All right, we're almost there. So I hope this gave you a sort of a flavor of, of what that shift to streaming looks like. Yes, it's a shift. You have to do a little bit of work um, in, in both how you think and how you organize um, it, it, your systems and engineering, but um, uh, perhaps this makes it more familiar. Uh, we also hope that the, this, this idea of, of stream analytics being core to um, your, uh, your quality of service data is, is, an, interesting, is an interesting reason um, to take back to your job um, and, and sort of feel empowered to not just implement new features and move data from databases to database to databases, which is absolutely critical, but also do something that is um, sort of fundamental to what your company um, to what your company does. Um, so clearly, there's a lot more than that um, that you can do with with real-time data, uh, but that's just sort of one reason. Before we part, I wanted to, um, uh, or rather, uh, before we shift to Q and A, I wanted to touch on a couple things. So a few features that um, have to do with uh, running pipelines, uh, running stream analytics pipelines in real life um, that have come out in recent time and sort of recent months that I wanted to highlight, as well as a few more sessions uh, that will go deeper into some of the, some aspects of, of this topic that we haven't gotten a chance to touch on. Um, so um, first, the, the newer features in, in Cloud PubSub, what's very important for operating these systems is the ability to, to replay data, so to recover from problems. Um, that's not possible, you can also uh, you are now also able to discard messages in, in, uh, or, or events in bulk. Um, also look out for um, upcoming controls on where data is stored in this global service, as well as new, um, new ways of sort of optimizing costs where we, we, we've um, split off uh, egress data and, and local usage data. On Dataflow, uh, Stream Engine, um, uh, a streaming engine, which, which has hit GA recently, is a very interesting thing in that it offloads a lot of the state um, away from individual processing nodes, which makes them more disposable um, and so stable and also um, uh, much more flexible in terms of optimization. So uh, streaming out of scaling um, now works uh, much more granularly. And of course, in real life, um, not everybody loves Java, which is Dataflow's primary or first language. Um, so Python streaming um, is, is now in beta for, for Dataflow. And uh, if you stick around the conference there, uh, maybe um, a couple more languages that uh, we would be announcing. So uh, speaking of that, here's some sessions you might hit. I know they say that um, these, are, these are booked, but as you can see, there's always a, a seat um, you could find. Um, and also, there'll be videos and sli slides, I'm pretty sure, uh, are posted after the conference. So the, uh, the uh, in particular, I would like to highlight the Thursday, Thursday sections because the titles are a bit on nondescript. The uh, 1140 session, DA311, is going to dive into data flow and sort of what, what's, what's happening there. It's going to be a, a reasonably deep session. Um, the end uh, 235 um, on Thursday, GCP for Apache Kafka users is going to cover this topic from the perspective of uh, not using necessarily our native tools, but looking at, the, um, at Kafka as sort of a, a common departure point for this. 
Um, with that, that's all our content. I, I think you get a you get a chance to rate us. Uh, the way you do this is you open the app and you find the fifth star and you press on it. <laughs> if if you don't feel that you can do that and maintain you maintain your integrity, come yell at us in person. Um, we we love hearing feedback.